one of my favorite proofs in all of mathematics is from this book by Terence Tao. The book starts with a review of classical probability theory, and it includes no less than five separate proofs of the central limit theorem. Of all these different proofs, Terence Tao says, quote, The most elementary but still remarkably effective method available in this regard is the moment method. This moment method proof is the first time I really felt like I had that aha moment, and I really understood what was so special about the Gaussian bell curve, and why it's just right to give the final answer of the central limit theorem. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy my animated version of Terence Tao's proof of the central limit theorem. Imagine rolling an ordinary six-sided dice. All six outcomes are equally likely, so the distribution is completely flat. However, if you sum up two independent dice, the distribution is not flat. It's peaked at the most likely outcome of seven. For a sum of three dice, 10 and 11 are the most likely outcomes, and the distribution is now rounded at this peak. As you add up more and more dice, the distribution gets smoother and smoother. We can see that as you add more dice, the distribution is beginning to look like a nice bell curve shape. This specific bell curve shape is formally known as a Gaussian distribution. The idea that a bell curve approximates other distributions is the heart of the central limit theorem. This theorem states that any sum of random numbers gets closer and closer to a Gaussian as the number of terms goes to infinity. For dice rolls, this is exactly saying that the dice distribution at the top of the screen gets closer and closer to the Gaussian bell curve distribution at the bottom of the screen as we sum up more and more dice. Of course, there are specific terms and conditions that technically apply, but as a practical tool, the central limit approximation is one of the most useful ideas in all of probability and statistics. This is because there is a nice formula for the Gaussian bell curve, which just involves e to the minus one half x squared. So by using this formula, we can approximate probabilities for dice rolls. But the really mind-blowing thing about the central limit theorem is that it works for any random variables, not just dice rolls. No matter what random variable x you start with, when you add up independent copies x1 plus x2 plus x3 and so on, the distribution will still look more and more like the same Gaussian bell curve as you add up more and more terms. The fact that you get the same final bell curve shape no matter what x you start with is truly surprising to me. Why does this happen? How is it that sums of random variables are somehow forced into the bell curve shape? What is so special about the Gaussian that all sums eventually look like it no matter what you start with? One explanation comes from looking at the operation of convolution. This is an operation between two functions and is written as f star g. 3blue1brown Brown has a wonderful series of video explaining how exactly the central limit theorem works in terms of convolutions, which I've linked to in the video description. On one side, summing random variables exactly corresponds to the convolution of their distributions. The sum of the x's at the top of the screen, therefore, corresponds to many repeated convolutions. On the other side, 3 blue one brown shows a truly beautiful visualization using the symmetry of the bell curve to see why Gaussians are invariant under convolutions. In this video, I'm going to explain why Gaussians are so special from a completely different point of view that has nothing to do with convolutions. Instead of convolutions, the link between sums of random variables and Gaussians is a particular special sequence of integers. This sequence is made of double factorials, which are written with two exclamation points. Instead of multiplying together all the numbers like an ordinary factorial, in a double factorial, we skip over every other number when multiplying. So for example, seven double factorial is seven times five times three times one, which is the number 105 on our list. Five double factorial is five times three times one, giving the number 15 on our list. And three double factorial is just three times one, Our special sequence actually has zeros in every other entry, and only has the odd double factorials in it. In other words, our special sequence is actually a 50-50 mix of double factorials and zeros. In the rest of the video, I will show how this sequence is connected to both Gaussians at the bottom of the screen, and to sums of random variables at the top of the screen, in a way that explains why the central limit theorem is true. On the Gaussian side, the connection to double factorials is seen by taking the expected value of powers of a standard Gaussian. That is, for any integer k, we will look at the expected value of z to the power k, where z represents a standard Gaussian random variable. The sequence of numbers you get by doing this are called the moments of z. When k equals 1, we have simply the average of a standard Gaussian z. This is just 0, the very first number on our list. 
when k equals 2, we have the average of z squared, which is 1 for a standard Gaussian. This is the second number on our list. In general, the kth moment is exactly the kth number of our special sequence. When k is even, the general formula is k minus 1 double factorial. These are the odd double factorials from our sequence. And when k is odd, we simply get 0, which is the other half of our special sequence. Later in the video, I will show how you can calculate these moments directly from the probability density formula e to the minus 1 half x squared. This sequence of moments can be thought of kind of like a fingerprint for the Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian is the only distribution that has the special sequence as its moments. So if you can find the special sequence lurking around, you can be sure that the Gaussian is the culprit. This fingerprint idea is exactly how we will connect to the sums of random variables at the top of the screen. We will compute the moments of the sum by taking the expected value of this big sum to the power k. Unlike the Gaussian, there is no simple probability density function for the sum. So instead, we will expand out this big power of k as a sum of many, many terms. And as will be explained later in the video, a true combinatorial miracle happens here, and it will turn out that this big expected value can actually be written in a very simple way. It turns out that the expected value will be approximately given by the number of ways to partition k items into pairs. For example, when k equals 4, we are partitioning 4 items into pairs. If we label these items as a, b, c, d, we can count up all the ways to do this. One example is to pair a with c and b with d. Another way would be to pair a with b and c with d. Or finally, we can pair a with d and b with c. We can be sure that these are the only possible pairings for four items, because there are three choices for who we will pair A with, and once A's partner is chosen, the remaining two items must automatically be paired together. These configurations, which are shown here on the screen, are sometimes called the pair partitions of four items. The fact that there are three pair partitions here exactly corresponds to the number three on our special double factorial sequence when k equals four. This might seem kind of like magic. What do these weird pairings have to do with expected values of sums? We'll see later in the video when we do the details that the four items that we are pairing are actually the four copies of the sum which appear due to the exponent 4 we are looking at. And these pairings really do correspond in a very real way to counting specific terms out of a big soup of algebra you get when you expand this big sum. Leaving these details for later, let's look and see what happens when k equals 5. Now we have five items, a, b, c, d, and e which we want to group into pairs. There are actually zero ways to do this because 5 is an odd number. This exactly corresponds to the fifth number on our special sequence being 0. When k equals 6, we are partitioning 6 items into pairs. For example, we could have a with b, c with d, and e with f. In fact, there are actually three total possible pairings where a is with b. This is because once a and b are paired together, there are 4 items remaining, and we saw already that there are 3 ways to pair up 4 items. But actually, there are 5 different choices for who a could be paired with. For each choice, there are three ways to pair up the remaining items. This idea means that we can organize all the possible pairings into a 3x5 grid, as shown here. In each column here, A is paired with a different partner. On the left, A is paired with B, then A is paired with C in the next column over, and so on and so on, until A is paired with F in the rightmost column. Once the partner for A is chosen from these five possibilities, there are three possible pairings for the remaining four items. That is why there are three rows. We can think of this as choosing one of the remaining three possible partners for the next item over in the list. This shows that there are 5 times 3 equals 15 total possible pairings of 6 items. And this exactly corresponds to the fact that the sixth number in our special double factorial sequence is 15. In general, the number of ways to create this kind of pair partition with k items is exactly the kth number of our special sequence. When k is even, you have k-1 choices for who to pair a with, and then k-3 choices for the next item, and so on and so on. Altogether, this gives exactly the double factorial k-1 double factorial, which was on our sequence. When k is odd, there are simply no ways at all to make a pairing, and this again matches our special sequence which has a zero on all the odd entries. The fact that both Gaussians and sums of random variables are each connected to the double factorial sequence will explain why the central limit theorem is true. From this point of view, the Gaussian distribution is special because the moments of the Gaussian are exactly the same as the number of pair partitions. And pair partitions arise naturally from the algebra of multiplying and adding whenever you do a sum of any random variables. The rest of the video will have two standalone parts. In the first part, we will explain why Gaussian moments are equal to double factorials, 
using the formula e to the minus one half x squared. And then in the second part of the video, we will explain this miracle of combinatorics that relates moments of sums to the number of pair partitions of k items. We will now see the details of the connection between Gaussians and double factorials. For a standard Gaussian random variable z, we will calculate the expected value of z to the power k. We will show that this is equal to k minus 1 double factorial whenever k is even, and is equal to 0 whenever k is odd. This calculation goes by starting with the probability density function for a Gaussian, e to the minus 1 half x squared, and doing some integration tricks to integrate with this. To calculate the expected value of z to the power k, we will write it as an integral of x to the power k multiplied by the Gaussian probability density p sub z of x. Writing an expected value as an integral like this is sometimes referred to as the law of the unconscious statistician. In our case, the probability density function is e to the minus one half x squared normalized by a factor of square root of two pi, which is exactly the bell curve function. We bring out the constant factor of square root of two pi out to the front of the integral, and now we have a nice integrand made of just exponentials and powers. Looking at what we have, since it's a product of two terms, maybe we can somehow use integration by parts to do this integral. To make this work out nicely, we will split x to the power k into x to the power k minus 1 times x. And we donate the factor of x to the exponential term. This is perfect for integration by parts, because we notice x times e to the minus half x squared is the derivative of a simple function, so we can easily do the antiderivative of this term. And lucky for us, it's also easy to do the derivative of the first part too. Now we are perfectly set up to use integration by parts. Integration by parts turns this integral into a new integral with an extra minus sign. Usually in integration by parts, there is also an extra difference term, but that term is just zero here. We now do the derivative of x to the power k minus one, and we do the integral of x times e to the minus half x squared by using chain rule in reverse. The integral is minus e to the minus half x squared. This is because by chain rule, when you do the derivative of this, the extra factor of x is exactly what pops out. We now simplify away the minus signs and then pull out the constant factor of k minus one. Finally, we notice that the integral we are left with looks suspiciously like the integral we started with but with an x to the power k minus two appearing instead of x to the power k. In fact, by the law of the unconscious statistician, this integral is exactly equal to the expected value of z to the power k minus two. So all in all, we end up with a relation that says the expected value of z to the k is equal to k minus one times the expected value of z to the k minus two. We can now use this equation as a recursion relation. By solving it, we can find an actual number as the answer. For example, when k equals 2, we can calculate the expected value of z squared. Our recursion relation says that this is related to the expected value of z to the power 0. Following the formula, we see that we have to multiply by k minus 1. In this case, since k equals 2, this factor is just 1. Fortunately for us, z to the power of 0 is very simple. No matter what z is, this is always just 1. So we can immediately see that the expected value is also 1. Multiplying this base value of 1 by the multiplication factor of 1, we arrive at a final answer. The expected value of z squared is also equal to 1. To calculate the expected value of z to the power of 4, our recursion relation says that this is related to the expected value of z squared, which we just calculated. And this time, the multiplicative factor of k minus 1 is equal to 3. So starting at the base value of 1 again, and multiplying along this chain, we see that the expected value of z to the power of 4 is 1 times 3, which is 3. Using the same idea to set up the calculation for the expected value of z to the power of 6, We get a chain of 1 times 3 times 5, which gives us the answer 15. From this pattern, we see that the expected value of z to the power k is a chain 1 times 3 times 5, and so on and so on, which gives exactly k minus 1 double factorial whenever k is even. 
for odd valued exponents, like k equals 1, 3, or 5, the same type of multiplication chain works to relate these values to each other. However, the base case is different. Because Gaussians are symmetric, the base case, which is the expected value of z to the power 1, is equal to 0. So propagating the starting value of 0 along our chain of factors, we see that the expected value of z to the power k is always 0 whenever k is odd. This is exactly the final conclusion for the Gaussian moments that we wanted to show. We have seen how starting with the formula e to the minus 1 half x squared led us to the special double factorial sequence for the Gaussian moments. Next, we will see the connection between sums of arbitrary random variables and double factorials. Specifically, we will calculate the kth moment for a sum of n random variables, and we will show that this is approximately given by the number of pair partitions of k items, multiplied by a factor of square root of n to the k. This factor will explain why we have to normalize the sum by a factor of square root of n to get convergence to a Gaussian in the central limit theorem. As we've seen already, pair partitions are counted by double factorials. This is because you have k-1 choices for the first partner, then k-3 choices for who the next person's partner will be, and so on. This counting explains the connection between sums and double factorials. To prove this result, we are going to use some simple assumptions on the variables x. First, we will assume that the variables are centered, so they are mean 0. This means that every time we see the expected value of a variable x on its own, that expected value is 0. We will also assume that the variance of each term is 1. In this case, this just means that the expected value of each x squared is 1. And finally, we will assume independence between the various x's. The way we will use this independence in our proof is to split up powers, and so the expected value of a product involving an xi and an xj can be split into the expected value of xi times the expected value of xj. With these assumptions in place, we are going to build up the proof for general k by starting with the simple case k equals 1, and then building up to k equals 2, and 3, and higher and higher values of k. This will let us see the patterns that make the result work little by little until we finally see the general pattern. Let's start with the simple case where k equals 1. In this case, the exponent of 1 doesn't do anything, and we have a simple sum to look at. We can use the linearity of expectation to write the expected value of the sum as the sum of the expected values. Since all the x's are copies of the same thing, we can group them all together. There are n copies here, so we will write this as n times the expected value of xi, where we have used the notation with this variable i to represent any possible index from 1 to n. We can think of the factor of n that comes up here as arising because there are n possible choices for this variable i. By the mean zero assumption, each expected value here is just zero, and so unsurprisingly, we see that the mean of the sum is also zero. When k equals 2, we are looking at the sum squared. We write this out as multiplying two copies of the sum together, and we'll imagine expanding this whole big product out term by term. In the end, there will be n squared terms to deal with. These terms come from all possible combinations of choosing one x from the first bracket and another x from the second bracket. there will be a bunch of terms in the expansion that are squared terms. We will write these terms down as xi squared, where like before, the variable i just represents any possible index from 1 to n. These terms arise when we choose the same index from both the first and second bracket. For example, we could choose x1 from both brackets and have i equals 1, or we could choose x2 from both brackets when i equals 2, and so on and so on. In fact, we can see there will be exactly n such terms, because there are n ways to choose what the value of i will be. As things get more complicated, it will be helpful for us to associate a little diagram to this idea of choosing the same x from both brackets. The diagram we are going to associate with this is going to be the partition of two items, a and b, where the a and b are paired together into one block. The a represents the first bracket, the b represents the second bracket, and the block that contains both represents the variable i. The fact that a and b are together in our diagram represents our choice of using the same index from both the first and second bracket together. Next, we have to deal with all the other mixed terms from this expansion. These terms correspond to the choice of two different x's from the two brackets. We will write this down as xi times xj, with i and j representing two distinct indices that are different. 
looping over all possible choices for terms like this, we see there are n choices for the variable i, but then only n minus 1 choices for the variable j, because we must choose a different index for j. This means that the number of terms like this is n times n minus 1. The diagram we associate with this term is a partition of a and b into two singleton blocks, where a is on its own and b is on its own. The first block represents the variable i, and the second block represents the distinct variable j. The fact that a and b are in different blocks is representing the fact that we chose a different index for the first and second bracket. By using independence between xi and xj, we can split this up into the product of the individual expected values. We have now organized all the different terms in this big expansion, and we are finally ready to calculate the final answer. The expected value of xi squared is 1 because of the unit variance assumption. And the expected value of xi times xj is 0 because of the mean 0 assumption. So in the end, we see that the whole thing is just equal to n. Since we want to make sense of what is going on as the number of terms n goes to infinity, it makes sense now to divide both sides of the equation by n so we can get a reasonable limit. On the left-hand side, dividing by n corresponds to normalizing our sum by a factor of square root of n inside the bracket. And what we've shown is that when you normalize the sum like this, the expected value squared is always equal to 1. Moreover, looking at our calculations that led us here, we actually see that this final answer of 1 corresponds to the pair partition where a and b were together in one block. The other partition, where a and b were both singleton blocks, had no contribution in the end. That term just zeroed out. This idea will generalize as we move to higher and higher values of k. When k equals 3, we are looking at the sum cubed. Now we have three brackets, which we have to expand into n cubed total terms. Like we did before, we will collect up these terms into different groups, depending on if we choose the same or unique indices from the three different brackets. One group is terms of the form xi cubed. This comes from the situation where we choose the same xi from all three brackets. There is a factor of n for this term because there are n choices for the variable i. Diagrammatically, this term corresponds to the diagram, which consists of three items, a, b, and c, which are all in the same block together. This represents the idea that we chose the same index for all three brackets. Another type of term is where we have three distinct choices, xi, xj, and xl, with i, j, and l representing different indices. These terms come from the situation where we chose something different from each of the three brackets. There are n ways to choose the variable i, only n minus 1 ways to choose the distinct variable j, and only n minus 2 ways to choose the distinct variable l. The diagram associated with this is the partition where a, b, and c are each in their own singleton block. Fortunately for us, because we have terms with x on its own inside the expected value, by the mean zero assumption, this term is exactly zero. These terms have no overall contribution at all. There is one more flavor of term of the form xi squared times xj. One way these terms arise is to choose the same index for the first two brackets, represented by the variable i, and a distinct index for the third bracket, represented by the variable j. As a diagram, this is the partition where a and b are together in a block of two, and c is on its own as a singleton block. There are n choices for the variable i here, and only n minus 1 choices for the variable j. So there are n times n minus 1 total terms like this one. But we must be careful, because there are actually a few more ways to get this type of xi squared xj term. Another way is to choose the same xi from the first and last bracket, and a different xj from the middle bracket. This corresponds to the partition, where a is with c in a block of 2, and b is a singleton block. Yet another way is to choose the same xi from the second and third bracket, and xj from the first bracket. This corresponds to the partition where b and c are together, and a is on its own. Altogether, we can simply include a factor of 3 here to account for the three different partition diagrams, which consist of a block of 2 and a singleton block. We are once again lucky here because we have an xj on its own, so the expected value of this term is 0 by the mean 0 assumption. So finally, we see that the only surviving non-zero term is the n times expected value of xi cubed. All the other terms had at least one singleton block somewhere, and so they were zeroed out by the mean zero assumption. 
we are now ready to take our final answer and normalize by the factor of square root of n like we did before. After we divide both sides of the equation by square root of n cubed, we see that we have a factor of 1 over square root of n appearing on the right hand side. And now, when we take the limit as n goes to infinity, we see that this factor of 1 over square root of n will prevail and the whole thing will get closer and closer to 0. This might seem like a boring final answer of 0, but actually this is kind of a remarkable result. No matter what x you start with, the details of x get completely washed away by the large n limit. The third moment of the sum will always converge to 0 as n goes to infinity, no matter what x is. This is exactly the idea of the central limit theorem. No matter the x you start with, the details of x get washed away and the sum becomes more and more Gaussian as you add more and more terms. The very last example we will do is k equals 4. This will use the ideas we learned when k was 1, 2, or 3, and it will allow us to see the general pattern for general k. We start by expanding out into 4 brackets and imagine what it would be like to expand this out into n to the 4 terms. We can keep track of this big soup of terms by using the partition diagrams like we did when k was 2 or 3. Like we saw when k was 3, there are actually many many terms here that are just 0. This happens whenever any index appears on its own as a singleton because the mean 0 assumption makes those expected values 0. There are many examples of diagrams that have a singleton block somewhere. For example, the partition where a, b, c, and d are all singletons on their own has four singleton blocks. This corresponds to choosing four unique indices i, j, l, m for each of the four brackets. In this case, all four of these expected values from this term are zero because of the mean zero assumption. So this term is definitely zero. There are many other examples, like when there is a block of three and one singleton. Anytime there is a singleton somewhere, the mean zero assumption for that singleton will cause the entire term to be zero. Other than these terms that are exactly zero, there are some terms like we saw when k was 3 that are non-zero but are vanishingly tiny as n goes to infinity. This will happen whenever the number of blocks in the partition is fewer than k over 2. When there are so few blocks, there are also very few free variables, i, j, etc., and so the number of terms is just too small to matter. For example, the partition with only one block where a, b, c, and d are all together is like this. This corresponds to choosing the same variable xi from all four brackets. Since there is only one block here, there is only one free variable i. There are n choices for the variable i, so the number of terms here is n. When we will normalize the sum by square root of n, this term will become something that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Finally, the only thing we haven't yet accounted for are the pair partitions, where the four brackets are split into two pairs. This is the only way to avoid having a singleton block somewhere and to also have at least k over 2 blocks total. The pair partitions are like the Goldilocks of all the partitions. There are not too many blocks which would have a singleton somewhere, and at the same time, there are enough free variables so the number of terms is large enough to matter. They are just right to survive in the limit as n goes to infinity. For example, we could pair a with b and c with d. This corresponds to choosing the same index from the first two brackets and a different index from the last two brackets. Or we could pair a with c and b with d. Or the final third option would be to pair a with d and b with c. All in all, this partitioning argument shows that the expected value can be written in a simple way. The only terms that are non-zero are the terms from expected value of xi to the power 4, which comes with a coefficient of n, plus the term expected value of xi squared times xj squared, which comes with a coefficient of n times n minus 1, and with an extra coefficient of 3 here because this term corresponds to the three contributing pair partitions. The last two expected value terms with x squared are simply equal to 1 here because of our unit variance assumption on x. We now normalize the sum by dividing through so that a square root of n appears on the bottom. And finally, we can take the limit to see that the only surviving term is the contribution from those Goldilocks pair partitions. All the other terms are either exactly 0 or go to 0 as n goes to infinity. In this case, where k was equal to 4, the final answer is 3. This exactly corresponds to the three pair partitions of four items. If you understand what is going on in this case where k equals 4, the same general argument applies and generalizes to any value of k. The final limit is always just the number of pair partitions on k items. 
welcome to the end of the video. If you made it this far, you're through all of the proofs, uh, so congratulations on that. If you made it this far, uh, leave a comment to let me know that you made it. Um, they do get a little involved at the end with all those pair partitions and seeing how to partition things, but uh, hopefully you find it as exciting as I do. Um, in this last little bit, I'm just going to recap everything we did uh, from start to finish so you can see all of the parts uh, from a high level and how they go together. So what did we do in this video? Um, we started with this special sequence. Uh, it was a sequence one, zero, one, zero, three. Oh, we started with zero. There's no one. Okay. <laughs> the first number is zero uh, because we're starting at one. Uh, zero, one, zero, three, 0, 15, and so on. And that sequence was this thing. It's the odd double factorials, k minus 1 double factorial, if k is even. And it's the just 0, if k is odd. 0, if k is odd. So we saw that throughout the video. Um, k minus 1 double factorial, if k is even, and 0, if k is odd. Uh, those are the double factorials. We didn't give that a name in the main part. But let's give it a name now. Let's call this D sub K. So that's the sequence D sub K. D stands for double factorial, double factorial, which is such a cool name. Okay. Um, so we had the sequence D sub K, and we showed two things that were connected to it. And one of those things was Gaussians. So Gaussians, Gaussians. And for a Gaussian, Z, which has this uh, formula, E to the minus 1 half X squared, divided by square root of 2 pi. We started with this formula, and we showed using integrals that if you calculate the expected value of z to the power k, which is some number, that's exactly the sequence from before. So we said, for all k, for all k, the expected value of z to the power k, we calculated it, it was exactly this double factorial sequence. So this is equal to dk, that special sequence um, that we had. OK, so that's one connection. Gaussians are connected to the DKs. What is the other connection? The other connection was sums of any random variable. So for sums, we had some assumptions. So under mean zero, mean zero, and unit variance, unit variance, and independent, which are the assumptions you kind of need for the central limit theorem. Um, it turns out mean zero and unit variance you can modify quite easily to include things that are not mean zero and not unit variance, but just for simplicity we did mean zero and unit variance. Under these assumptions we calculated the same exact kind of thing. So we calculated the expected value of x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 all the way up to xn, and we calculated this to the power k, and we did the expected value. And we did a big calculation, you get a big mess, so this is not some simple thing. And it, But it turns out that you a lot of the terms are zero, and actually a lot of the terms are tiny. So when you want to calculate what this is, if you look as n is getting bigger and bigger, there is one dominant term, and that dominant term is what we calculated. To make the dominant term sort of appear and have a finite limit, it turns out you have to divide by the square root of n. So that's a very important normalization factor. If you div divide by the square root of n, then you get exactly some non-trivial finite limit. Um, and so you can do the limit as n goes to infinity, and when you do the limit as n goes to infinity, there's only one term that survives. And that term was exactly the pair partitions. So this was a number of pair partitions, pair partitions of k items. That's what we saw. Um, so all the other terms kind of vanish when you do this thing, the normalization. So normalizing by square root of n is going to shrink away all of the other terms, and you're left with only the term, which is given by the pair partitions, when you take the limit as n goes to infinity. And the nice thing for us, the number of pair partitions of k items is exactly, again, this formula dk. So if you have an even number of things, how many pair partitions are there? Well, there's k minus 1 choices for who a's partner will be. Whoever is next in line after a's partner is chosen, there's k minus 3 choices for their partner. Whoever is next in line after that, there's k minus 5 choices for that. You multiply them all together, you get k minus 1 double factorial for an even number of things. If you have an odd number of items and you ask how many pair partitions are there, there's none. There's zero pair partitions. So this number of pair partitions is exactly was exactly equal to dk. So these are the two connections for Gaussians and for sums to the sequence dk. Um, and so for Gaussians, for Gaussians, it's exactly equal to dk. It's always equal to dk. And for sums, when you do the limit as n goes to infinity, you get dk. And again, this holds for all for all k in both cases. So you fix a value of k, you do the calculation, 
for Gaussians, you do the calculation for sums and take the limit, and you get the same final answer at dk. So this is a kind of convergence that says that sums and Gaussians are related. This kind of convergence is called moment convergence. So written a different way, moment convergence. What we have shown is that for every k, for every k, so for every integer k, if you do the limit as n goes to infinity of this normalized sum, the expected value of x1 plus x2 and so on, all the way up to xn divided by square root of n to the power k, that's exactly the same thing as we had before. That limit is equal to the expected value of z to the k, right? That is what we actually showed. Um, we showed it by showing they're both this double factorial sequence, but the point is that the limit of one is exactly equal to the other one. They're both equal to dk. And you can say they, they're both dk, both equal to dk. So when you have the limit of one thing, the moments converging to the limit of the other thing, that is called moment convergence. So we have moment convergence of this big random variable, the normalized sum, to z. Their, their moments are getting closer and closer together. And it is a fact that moment convergence implies a different type of convergence called convergence in distribution. So convergence in distribution. Um, so convergence in distribution, sometimes people write with this, this kind of fat arrow. So they say x1, x1 plus x2, and so on, all the way up to xn divided by square root of n. Fat arrow converges to z, that's convergence in distribution. And it in particular means all sorts of nice things you would want. So um, for example, in most cases, you know, there's some technicalities, but uh, the probabilities of this thing being bigger than some value c that will equal the probability that z is bigger than c in the limit as n goes to infinity. So if you want to calculate limits for probabilities of sums, you can just use uh, the, the probability for Gaussian. Um, so this is called convergence in distribution. It says that uh, they are converging as probabilities or, or things like that. And it is a fact that moment convergence in some cases implies convergence and distribution. So we proved moment convergence in the video. To see why moment convergence implies convergence and distribution, there are a bunch of technicalities, and I will refer you to this very nice book uh, where they do everything. So they really do this whole, this whole thing from start to finish. All the details are in here, and you can see why moment convergence is good enough to imply convergence and distribution uh, in this case. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's a couple extra things uh, I'll say maybe, but I'll put those in an extra video if I do those. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video and uh, learned something about the uh, central limit theorem.